There's something very strange that is happening in the world of basketball. This is not 1992. 120 international players. We all know that international basketball has gotten better, but this weirdness doesn't have to do with the fact that we just lost. It's specifically how we lost and specifically how American players and quote analysts are responding to this loss. Any team that gets hot from three can win and that's what happened. They just didn't have enough size. FIBA rules and how that game is played. After charting and studying hours of game that film, is crazy. I want to share some data that surprised me. Data that I think goes deeper than the game of basketball. Data that I think might surprise you. This is the new revolutionary war, except this time it's the Americans who appear to be the bloated ones who can't really figure out how to fight. And not just with England, it's with the world. I've played a lot of basketball in my life. Here in this gym in high school. College, England, Spain. Hey, Michael, Michael, man. It wasn't until this moment, my first experience with international basketball, that I noticed something different, something in the way that Europeans played. I didn't make a ton of money playing overseas or playing the ACC, but I did play at several different levels. And so far from what I have seen, these trends apply to every level of basketball. But nobody seems to be articulating this correctly. The only problem that we have is when we don't send our best. We do have the best players, and they did not play. We're also not sending our best players. Because Josh Hart's on the team, they're, they're not, not the best even players. Talking about we need more nukes. Basketball players. No Kevin Durant, no Steph Curry, no LeBron James. We lost because we did not send our best talents. We need more weapons. We need more freaking nukes. Okay, th this is true, but who did we send? Four All-Stars, the Defensive Player of the Year, two likely additional All-Stars this year, and six very solid NBA players. How about the rest of the world? Well, the two teams we lost to, Germany had three NBA bench players and one NBA starter for a very bad team. No All-Stars. Lithuania had one current NBA player. One. He ain't no. Uh... Maybe, but one thing we can all agree on, the market does believe that these Americans are exceedingly more valuable than any other FIBA team, certainly the two they lost to. Obviously, it's not the best American players, but if we just examine this team in comparison to their competition here, it's clear the market believes these Americans are far more valuable, far more talented. So why is lack of talent being used as an excuse, and why are these Americans losing despite this massive value disparity? But they chose to play small. We sent a team over there with no big man. They killed us on Too the glass! Small. Now, if you're lucky to get past somebody sharing this novel insight that LeBron or Steph wasn't on Team USA, the next line of reasoning you might hear is size. Even though our B-team guards are still wildly more talented than the rest of the world and certainly paid more, uh, the reason why we lost is because we just weren't big enough. If this team had size and rebounding, they would be gold medalists. I mean, just look at these losers. None of these guys could even get an NBA contract. We just lost because they were bigger than us. <laughs> Wait. If these guys can't make it in the NBA, why are they abusing us? We need to do something insane. Watch the tape. So uh, we, we'd like to start today with the breakout player for Team USA, uh, the, the man who's got that dog in him. Uh, different, different dog. Still, still not the, not the dog we want. What kind of dog? Uh, no. Dog. Anthony. Ant-Man, Edwards, start it up, St start it up. Make you dance a bit. Oh, Wagner goes at his teammate, and Demons right there. Germany's best player, the long three. And then Tice, to eight offensive rebounds that Germany has. Yeah. Stop. Stop it. Stop the highlight. Anthony Edwards. 
So I've heard this objection of size so frequently in my career. I think people need to have a reason as to why we lost. And height disparity is an easy story to tell, a narrative, but this is a cheap one. And I think Anthony illustrates this wonderfully. How many of these offensive rebounds could have been avoided with just a simple box out? For my count, Lithuania had 12 second chance points off of just clear missed box outs, and Germany had 11. We lost those games by six and two. So if we just cut that in half, if the US had just cut that in half, what could be argued that we would have won those games? Size is clearly important, but basketball is a game full of trade offs. You can play small and fast, and typically your three point shooting gets a little bit better because you're playing, well, hopefully better shooters, more guards. Something that's been well established, teams are getting smaller and smaller. Something that's been less established, well, NBA teams, they're not really crashing the boards. Offensive rebounding is down significantly. NBA teams are opting for more transition defense in lieu of really offensive rebounds. This is correlated, but why would they do this? To win the game, to score more points than the other team. You can crash the boards, play transition defense, and play small. This isn't a one-for-one -one trade off So I think the only reason why teams are maybe not crashing the boards as much is because, well, it's the easiest thing to do. Nevertheless, offensive rebounds weren't the only variable. Far from it. When we think about the evolution of the NBA, smaller players and more space come to mind. Spacing is kind of like the first middle school dance you attend. There's acceleration, deceleration. Sometimes players are just awkwardly standing still. And over time, intuitively, players learn the lucrative pockets of the game, their place in space. But when stillness becomes paralysis, well, there can be a point of diminishing returns. Now, traditionalists will say this is just hero ball, lack of ball movement, but rather than just settling for that nondescript answer, why do we even move the ball in the first place? Well, you know, the ball moves faster than you can dribble. Which, to be fair, based on our testing, actually is true. However, this is where any form of science seems to end for our traditionalists, because if we just pause for a second, how is it that a player knows when they should shoot versus pass. Not every shot is open. In fact, getting an open shot, that's a very difficult thing to do. And each possession, at least most possessions, they have one last pass, one final act of sorts, followed by a player rising up and attempting to place a sphere into a cylinder. How is it that this player knows that this is the best possible shot for their team? I have seen very few analysts talk about this. In fact, it's just a classic case usually of hindsight bias. Shots that go in are attributed to quality offense. He patience, he set the screen up, going the other side. Great start for him. Well, bad shots are often referred to as just a lack of ball movement or just not a good shot to take, only after the shot doesn't go in. Sure that was a good shot. This just doesn't help us. So I decided to graph the success rate of ball movement by using the same measuring stick we deployed in high school. There's usually someone to catch it. Reversals. A ball reversal involves a pass or dribble action that moves the ball from one half of the court to the other half of the court, and the results were fascinating. And by the way, please subscribe if you haven't. Thanks. In our Lithuania game, Team USA reversed the ball 25 times. Possessions where they failed to reverse the ball once, they scored 38% of the time. On the possessions where they did manage to reverse the ball, their scoring efficiency skyrocketed to 76%. So how frequently did the Lithuanians reverse the ball? 55 times by my count, more than double the United States. And a similar efficiency pattern could be found here. Their percentage more than tripled when they were able to reverse the ball at least once, leaping from 26% to 82% on just one reversal. With such a massive difference in ball movement at this level, I didn't want to assume this was just the case each time, so I tracked the Germany game as well. Similar trends. 
Germany reversed the ball even more, 76 times, partly because there were longer possessions and less turnovers in this game. While the United States was able to reverse the ball just 39 times, each team saw their scoring percentages again significantly increase as they reversed the ball. In fact, in general, Team USA just kind of passed on passing. They passed the least in the entire FIBA tournament. Now, I don't think passing is a perfect indicator. Not all passes are created equal, but this is somewhat telling. If we just slow it down, we can examine the physics as to why a reversal often leads to higher efficiency. So here's a quick example, okay? Ball's gonna cascade across the court, pause it. Just even this first reversal is already putting pressure on Team USA. They have to move if they want to stay in good position to help out. Play it. Ball is going to go into Jonas Brothers Valanciunas, pause it. This is a critical pass because now we have several micro decisions that have to take place for Team USA. And our boy Anthony Edwards maybe doesn't make the best decision here again. He helps out. We got three players in a very tight space. Lithuania recognizes this. Player cuts in the middle to put pressure on Josh Hart. Josh Hart does a good job helping out. Our other Lithuanian recognizes this. He fades to the corner. Jonas Brothers Valanciunas. He now realizes just one pass will completely collapse this Team USA defense. One more reversal, and they'll get the shot they want. Go ahead and play it. Ball comes across the court. Brunson does a good job closing out. Ball comes up to the top. Lithuania gets the high percentage three-point chance they're looking for. So if reversing the ball is such an advantage, how well does it translate to the NBA? I charted this for a few NBA games, not a large enough sample size to be a science, but potentially some trends might emerge here. First, I wanted to start with the best modern NBA ball movers. If we remember back in 2015, the Warriors hired Kerr to replace Jackson, a move that would wind up revolutionizing the game. At the time, I thought this was kind of a strange deal. Jackson had just won more than 50 games, but within one season, we saw the effect of Kerr's offense. Offensive efficiency shot through the roof, and the Warriors won a lot. They won a championship that year, went to the finals the next year, and won a championship the year after that. But I wanted to go back to this 2015 team, a team that was largely the same as the Jackson team before that, and just chart it to see how often the Warriors reversed the ball. Since this isn't a publicly available stat from what I can see, I wanted to see if there was this trend against Oklahoma City in a playoff game, a game where the Thunder were favorites, a game that had implications. Unsurprisingly, the Warriors reversed the ball better than Oklahoma City, a team with arguably the best isolation scorer in the world, Kevin Durant. Not Dion Waiters. Sorry, Dion. Kevin. Not Steph. He's good too. Even with NBA rules, the trend continued. Both teams shot significantly better after reversing the ball just one time. Oklahoma City was similar to Team USA. With so many talented players, they relied on isolations, pick and rolls, far more often. But when they happened to just reverse the ball, they were just like any other team that I charted. They wound up with a much higher efficiency. Again, this isn't a large enough sample size to conclude that this is a science, but we can see that there are some potential trends here. In fact, I saw this across all three NBA games that I charted, games that featured far different NBA teams. I would be shocked if Golden State has not led the league in ball reversals since Kerr came in in 2015. Now, uh, arguably, screening and cutting is just as important. It really works in tandem with ball movement, ball reversals in this case. Players get out of position with a ball reversal. A player cuts, likely off a screen, to an opening to enjoy the most efficient points per possession out of any charted NBA play type. So what teams lead the league in frequency of cutting? Uh, well, five very good offensive teams. Uh, Three of them arguably the best three teams in the NBA. And who happened to be the associate head coach sitting right next to Steve Kerr? Mikey Mike. Mike Brown. The current Kings head coach. I don't think that's coincidental. I also saw this trend continue in every international NBA game I charted in. <laughs> Here's where we find some truly remarkable American bias. Oddly, we haven't had an NBA team play a EuroLeague team since 2016 when OKC played Real Madrid. And strangely today, actually, Dallas is playing Real Madrid. So it's the first time in seven years. If we go back the last 15 years, NBA teams are 20 and eight against EuroLeague competition. And 
The average point differential of these games? Well, about nine. It wasn't even double digits. And these were often games against the best NBA teams, typically playoff teams. And the NBA teams were playing their best players. So on average, yes, the NBA teams are better, but not even by double digits. So when it comes to European basketball, there's really different tiers. I always compared it to minor league baseball here in the States. So a single A team and a major league team, the players might say, yeah, we're both professional players, but they're not really the same professional players and teams. Similarly, in Spain, I played against mostly third division Spanish teams. They weren't as good as the top division, the ACB, full of obviously much better players, much higher payroll. So point being is there's difference in the tiers if that isn't already apparent with kind of the one exception being you have the Euro League, which takes the best teams from all these different countries. But the point is not every international basketball team is the same. I mean, imagine if Real Madrid's basketball team beat the Indiana Mad Ants, then just proceeded to gloat about it to the rest of the world. That would be laughable. Yet somehow every international team, at least to the media, is akin to the Shanghai Sharks, a basketball graveyard of sorts full of washed up players and teams that would lose to NBA teams by 50. That's just not true. Assuming the EuroLeague would consistently be steamrolled by any NBA team, even good ones, goes against all the data and games we've had from the previous 15 years. It's obviously true. The NBA has the best basketball players in the world, largely because they have the resources to attract it. It's also true that the United States produces more talented basketball players than any other country in the world. But there's a third potential crucial, fascinating truth that I find. These international teams are playing in a way that levels the playing field despite massive talent disparities and massive valuation disparities. Uh, EuroLeague teams are sometimes beating NBA teams with not that much money. And well, Team USA is losing even with far more valuable players. This seems to be hidden in plain sight and it's a trap that many sports teams fall into. When you lose, it's clear that adjustments should be made. When you win, the tendency is to just, well, keep doing what you're doing because it worked. This could prove to be fatal for the Americans even as they pull together another Monstar squad. It could very well be the case that despite winning these gold medals, they've been playing in a losing way. Talent is just the cover up. In 2008, the US won every Olympic game by double digits. In 2012, they were challenged twice, games that they won by 10 points or less. In 2016, there were four of these games. And in 2020, well, the U.S. suffered their first loss in 16 years. 2024 might be the tipping point. So there appears to be a significant advantage for any team anywhere to move the ball and to move away from the ball. So why aren't more NBA teams doing this? And why hasn't Team USA figured this out? I have been asking this question since playing for my high school team, seeing the unparalleled success we had with this style of play. Before my coach arrived, our high school team had zero league championships, zero state appearances, and zero state championships. And since he arrived, 15 league championships and seven state championships. The state we never recruited. We weren't some big private school that just got all the best talent. We were just local kids committed to a winning system again this style of play appears to win at every level but just because something is simple doesn't mean that it's easy steve kerr could have very well fallen into the familiar nba coaching trap of just managing egos rather than implementing a system and oddly this reminded me of one of my friends his dad always seemed to play more of a role of a buddy than a parent and when you're trying to prepare somebody for the cruel, challenging world, this might actually be detrimental. Some might say that this is because the NBA is a star's league, catering more to entertainment rather than the way the game should be played. I strongly disagree with this. And in the next video, I will show you exactly why. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't. Hope you enjoyed this video. Take care.